wrap up, to finalize our course. So I'm showing you here the lecture course. Okay, last lecture we have discussed the EOF analysis or principal component analysis. Did anybody try to do the exercise? If not, you will do that later, of course. And I'm, I'm ready to look at your results in the Slack channel, if you want to. Then today we want to discuss the predictability, some basics of the predictability, because this is something quite important. Because you now if intuitively we know that there are, that there are predictability limits, uh, it's intuitively it's clear to everybody, I think, that we cannot try to predict the weather on a particular day a few months ahead. That's, that is impossible because we know that the times, the typical time scales of the atmospheric error growth, and we will discuss this in this lecture more in details, is very small, is a, is a few days or weeks maybe. So we cannot pretend that we can predict the exact weather on one on one day, let's say next Christmas or something like this. But we can hope for to predict some statistics of that. So, so what will be the mean, the December mean or the, the, the winter mean temperature? Will it be different from the climatologically expected temperature? And so on. The same is of course true for climate change uh, simulations. So you cannot expect that a climate um, projection gives you the precise weather in 2050 or something like this, obviously. But we can only say uh, the average, on average in 2050, maybe it will be warmer in, in, in some tropical region than it is now or in the exotropics, wherever we are interested in. So this is intuitively clear to us. We want to put some of the, uh, some theory and some, some measures behind this kind of intuitively clear features. Now, the chaos, the basics for, for, for this predictability analysis, um, I want to show this example, how the chaos theory was developed again by this a famous metrologist Edward Lawrence, who has done so many things, who uh, we've seen that in the last lecture has introduced um, the empirical orthogonal function analysis into climate and weather analysis. And he has also developed this, law, this uh, energetic uh, viewpoint for the atmospheric um, circulations. And he has also developed the, the chaos theory that was is not only relevant for climate and weather, but is now you know, very much used in the mathematical community. Now, how did it go? So uh, uh, Lawrence at uh, the 1960s, he was interested in studying atmospheric, nonlinear atmospheric behavior. And as we did already so many times, I mean, he was, of course, interested maybe in the general circulation, circulations between tropics and extra tropics or circulations just in the tropics. But since the equations, you know, we know everything is governed by our Navier-Stokes equations. This is so complicated. He said, OK, we want to, we want to reduce the complexity. I want to just to study some some basic principles of, of nonlinear equations that should be also relevant for the general circulation. So he decided he wanted to study a very well-known system, which is uh, if I have a pot with water and I put it on a stove, then I heat it from the bottom. What is happening? What is happening in this pot? Uh, so those equations, were already quite well known in that period. How, of course, if we want to describe the circulation that is happening, if we heat now this pot on a stove, 
we can solve, in, in principle, we should solve the Navier-Stokes equations again. This is a classical uh, fluid dynamical problem. But fortunately for this particular very controlled setting, uh, uh, some clever scientists, and we will look at this late, at that later, were able to derive a very sim much simplified set of equations for this. But that set of equations is even simplified in an approximation, a crude approximation to this setting. And of course, it's a much cruder approximation to what Lawrence was really interested in, to study the general circulation or, or circulation features in the tropics, which have actually nothing to do directly with this stove that is, uh, with this pot that is heated on a stove. But the story is quite interesting because uh, 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 what, what is told is that Lawrence discovered this in principle. Uh, he integrated these, uh, these equations that we will show later on a computer in the 1960s. And, um, and even in the United States at that point, he worked at the MIT, there were power cuts often frequently. So he was afraid. So one evening before he went home, he said, okay, I, I let the computer run. So tomorrow morning I come early in, I want to see the, this evolution of these, the solutions of these equations. But in order to be sure that nothing is going wrong, that I save something, he noted down some values. This is essentially, he need, just needed to write down three values because it turned out we, uh, the system of equation that he is, was integrating was just a coupled ordinary system of, 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 of coupled three equations. So he needed to, to know three values to restart the simulations because he was afraid of a power cut and then the simulations would crash. And so he wanted to restart this. So we noted down these three values and uh, as, ma as many digits as he could as, as it was the, from the output. But then the models integrated over the night, of course. But in the morning when he came back to the office, he found indeed at some point in the night after he, much after he noted these numbers, the model crashed, the, there was a power cut. And so he had to restart the simulation. And he restarted the simulation using these numbers that he has written down. Now, um, the, 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 the equations that he has analyzed, which we will, we will be showing later, that is an autonomous set of equations, three coupled uh, ordinary differential equation, autonomous. That means that the solutions are exactly determined by the initial conditions. There's nothing else you need to know. If you have the initial conditions, you can integrate the system. So his idea was, even though the model crashed, I can reproduce exactly having these three initial conditions that are the state of this system at some point, I can simply continue this simulation. And he did that. However, he had the output from what has happened over the night until a certain point, until the model crashed. And to his surprise, he compared these two solutions and found that after maybe just a hundred time steps of, this, of running these simulations, the two solutions were completely different. So he wondered why, how can this be? I have restarted the model from the same numbers. Why should the solutions deviate? And the reason was that the computer internally carried on more digits than, than there was in the output. So maybe the computer carried on eight digits behind the decimal and, and he just wrote down four. And so these small differences after just maybe a hundred time steps made the solution completely diverge. And that made Lawrence thinking and he thought, and he, uh, based on this observation, he developed the, the, the chaos theory. So how can this be that if I have tiny differences in my initial conditions, how can the, uh, the solutions be so different after some time? It's at that point, apparently that wasn't so clear. One expected that if I, if I start the simulations from two very close initial conditions, then the solution should stay close a long time or maybe forever. 
which would be the case probably for uh, just a linear system. Uh, you expect that you, you, you linear oscillator, if you, if you have an initial condition that is slightly different, the solutions will stay close for, uh, for, forever, essentially. Now, he, he developed this theory in a, in a paper and he published this paper in 1963. And uh, since he published this in a metrological paper, and it was very complicated, there were some people were interested in this, but um, so in the first 10 years after he published that, he got 10 citations. That means that someone has read and based his further research on, on that paper or just named that, that paper in that, that research. But then suddenly the math, the math community, they got interested in this phenomenon and they discovered this paper. And then in one year, just one year, he got 3,000 citations, which is a lot. It's, it's really a lot if, you, if you're working in this field. And then it, nowadays, this paper is probably the, one of the most cited papers there is in the world uh, taking any scientific output into account, probably the most cited paper ever. I don't know. I, I cannot tell you now how many citations, but it must be hundreds of thousands of citations that this article has. So this tells you, you all become researchers, right? You will all do your PhD and become researchers. So you do, a, you do a study that you think is very good and publish it and no one, no one looks at it. Don't get frustrated. Maybe, maybe after 10 years, someone will discover your work and say, wow, you know, and then suddenly uh, you become famous too. So imagine, Lawrence, really for 10 years, this has just been ignored, essentially, this paper. Really, 10 citations in 10 years is not very great. It's just okay, but it's, it's not, nothing particularly. But then this boom, he became famous, and uh, of course, uh, it was a, a big story. Now, the, we, we have already looked at this setup. We have this pot on the heated stove, and that was the set of equations that um, Lawrence looked at. A very crucial parameter, of course, here you can imagine is the temperature difference between the warmed bottom and the colder top. And this is kind of taken as a, this will be the main parameter that is, is varied then. If you, if you increase the heating, you, you increase the temperature difference between the bottom and the top in principle in this, in this pot. And so Lawrence was thinking this could be somehow representative of what the atmosphere is doing uh, in the tropics, for example. It's heated from the bottom and then it's cooler at the top and then convection happens. So somehow that, that is similar. So what is happening now? If we think about what is happening in this pot, if we have a very, if we heat very, very little, probably what can happen is that there's no flow at all in our pot. So the, the heat conduction is just done by molecular heat conduction. But then we increase the temperature, we increase the heating, we increase the temperature difference. And then as you well know, if we do that long enough, in the end there will be, the water will be boiling. So there's movement. But before the water is boiling, boiling and the movement becomes very chaotic, there is a phase when you, we get very regular circulation cells, depending on the size of the pot, of course, how many cells they are. But there is a, uh, there's a heating amount where we get just regular circulation cells. And then if we increase the heating further at some point, we get just you know, very chaotic and, and boiling motion in the, in the pot. So that, that is the system that Lawrence has, has analyzed in principle. Now, this, the, the equations that he has analyzed are, are called the Lorentz equations. Uh, no, it's, um, they are based, so just to tell you, they are based on the thermohydrodynamic equation. So, for example, the momentum equation, dv by dt my, is equal to minus one over rho uh, gradient p plus other terms. We don't need, in this case, of course, the Coriolis term because the Coriolis term will be a very small term 
now uh, if we just have a pot heated on the stove. But we have the coupling with the thermodynamic equation, of course. And what, what is done, I will not derive that, is also quite complicated. But in principle, what is done is, since the system is so simple, they try to insert, for example, for the vertical velocity, or in reality, then they, they, they transform this set of equations into stream function and divergence and so on. But let's say we do it for the vertical velocity. We assume that the vertical velocity is given by an amplitude function that just depends on time and some structure function, fixed structure function in the vertical and in the horizontal directions. If we insert that in these equations, and if we are lucky, then to a first order, it, should, it can be possible that we find a set of equations just, just for the amplitude time dependence, because all these other terms may just cancel out each other. And that, that was done in some work. So it turns out such an approach to assume that our, all our dynamic variables are separated between an amplitude that is time dependent and then some kind of structure function, sine and cosine function in the z and in the uh, x direction and y direction. That gives us the set of equations that we are looking at. So usually these are referred to x, y, and z, which, which are now our independent, independent amplitude functions. So the x variable, just to tell you, would be related to the to the stream function of our fluid. So as I mentioned, they, they transformed the system into stream function, uh, um, velocity potential and, and, and temperature. And the Y and X and the Z variables are related to um, the time dependence of temperature. In particular, it's deviation from the linear temperature profile. But it really doesn't matter uh, for our treatment, what exactly they are standing for. In principle, they are an approximation to the to this full Navier-Stokes equations. And the equations that in the end turn out, if you do this, is this set of three coupled equations. So we have an equation. So, so if I write x dot, that means the x by dt, right? This is another way to write it. Y dot and z dot is equal to something on the right-hand side. They look quite simple. And they are things that we may interpret as coupling terms because they appear in different equations with a different sign. And then there are something like damping terms because if we ignore, for example, in this equation, this first term here, then the solution of this equation, what would that be? Just an exponential decaying. It's just a damping. It's just an, and this damping term is there in all of these equations. So that's the frictional, that is the action of the frictional forces in principle. But the main thing about this equation is that they are non-linearly coupled. The, the, complicated thing. If they were not nonlinear, you can you could easily solve this. It's just a, as a linear autonomous system of equations, coupled system of equations, linear, you could so just solve this equation with sine and cosine functions. The problem is that there, that there is a nonlinear coupling terms here. Very simple. It's a, it doesn't seem to be so complicated, just quadratic terms. No, these terms are actually not a coupling because between these two, because there are different variables here. But anyway, they are, they are, they are nevertheless, obviously they're coupled. Now there are some parameters appearing in these equations. So one parameter is the Prandtl number, P, which is a, a measure of the kinetic vis viscosity to its thermal, uh, diffusion coefficient. Then there is this parameter B, which is more or less some kind of uh, geometric parameter, which gives us the, 
the, it's related to the height of our system, related to this, to the to the size of the convection cells. That will be set to just some value um, that depends on the side, really on the size of the of the pot that we are using. But the the only uh, parameter that is really varied is this Rayleigh number, which is a dimensionless measure of the temperature difference between the bottom and the top. So that number we can adjust by increasing our, our heating on the stove or decreasing it. That will, that will govern the behavior of our flow if this Rayleigh number is increased or decreased. Now you can solve this equation, of course, People have even thought, oh, this, we, you know, a clever mathematician should be able to solve these equations analytically. But it turns out that this is not possible. Until now, or even mathematicians have shown that there is no analytical solution to this equation. So the only way to, to you can analyze, you can analyze the structure of these equations, but you cannot solve these equations analytically but you can analyze kind of the behavior as a function of the parameters of this equation. And mathematicians, of course, have done this. Lawrence has done this in the first place, but then other mathematicians have refined and, and, and found more, much more properties that are in these equations. They look so similar, but they have such a rich kind of behavior, which, which we will see later leads us to this strange attractor behavior where the system is, is, is very chaotic, leads to very chaotic solutions. Um, so the strange attractor, they have this property that the dimension of the solution in the end is less than three, but more than two. So it's, there's some kind of convergence to something that is a, a fractional number to, to, between two and three that is governing the, uh, these degrees of uh, freedom are governing the set of equations. In order to solve this, you can, of course, simply use that we, that you will learn soon in your numerical methods two course. You will, you can simply use an Euler forward scheme to use this, to, to, to discretize the time derivative and to solve these equations, you can say x from time plus delta t is equal to, if I know this quantity at the time t plus delta t times what is on the right hand side of these equations. Euler forward scheme. Did, did you have that already? Did you discuss that already? This scheme is a simple scheme to, to integrate a, a dynamical equation. And it if you do that, you can do this. I've done this in a, you can do this probably in MATLAB. These equations are so simple. You can, you can integrate them in, no, in, in Python, sorry. You use Python. Just integrate them in Python using Euler forward. It's very simple. Then you can get beautiful solutions. The problem is if you, Euler forward is not very accurate. So if you do that, and I've done it, then you will find that the, the the parameter values where the, 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 these equations change their behavior are different from what is found in the literature. So the inaccuracy that comes with the, the, just the Euler forward discretization makes that these, if I change the parameter R, these, the solutions may change at a different point of this parameter R. So if you want to have a more accurate solution, you should use a higher order runge kutter scheme. But I think you will also introduce those schemes in your, in your numerical methods course. So you can use higher order solution schemes. But if you just want to play around a little bit with these equations, the Euler forward scheme is just good enough. So what is happening? As I mentioned, I've done that. So if here are just uh, solutions for X, Y, and Z, 
shown. And if I start from any point and the, this R value is very small, then the stationary state, or maybe we should first discuss the stationary states. Right? This system has, so how do we, first of all, how do we calculate the stationary state of this system? Stationary states turned out to be very important to consider. The stationary states, of course, we can calculate by setting the time derivatives to zero. And then we get a quadratic uh, couple system of, of equations. Now, one stationary state, we see that is zero. The stationary state zero has the physical meaning of no, no motion. So, so that is shown here. There is this, this physical state of, of, of no motion, which can be stable, actually. If, if the parameter r is smaller than one, this stationary state is stable. And this is a very interesting exercise to show this, that the stationary state of this system zero is stable if r is smaller than one. But then if you increase r, that becomes unstable. And the solutions will go into another, the other two solutions. So if we have divided this by x and so on, then we can derive the other two stationary solutions. It's also very simple, you can just do it. Is it just gives just a quadratic equation then. And you will find that they are symmetric. These stationary states are symmetric. So plus and minus, so you go from one place to the other. And they can become then also stable for some point, but if we increase R further, then they become again unstable. And then we get very complex behavior of the solutions. Let's have a look at these solutions. So as I mentioned, when we have a small r, we can start with whatever variable we want and they all will go back to zero. That's the, that's the zero flow is a stable solution. If we look in this phase space between the z and the x variable, then we start at some point and, and, and this system does some overshooting, but we go back to zero. On the other hand, if we increase this R, this, this, this heating at the stove uh, uh, above the threshold R uh, above one, then this solution becomes unstable. It's not, has no relevance anymore. And the other two solutions become stable. So if we have an increased R, wherever we start, we go back to this other stationary state, which in the phase space is located here. But now there are two of them. So depending on the initial condition that we prescribe, if we have positive or negative values of, of, of these variables, then it can also go to this other stationary state. So there's already some uncertainty dependent on, on where we start our system. We go either, the system converges either into one stationary state or into the other stationary state. Already some effects of nonlinearity is here. But then you increase this variable further. And then something very, you know, that you can find very interesting behavior because it seems then you can have oscillating behavior. It oscillates, the system oscillates in all variables for a long time, which in the phase space looks like you would start, where do we start here? We start here and then we go around this stationary state here and the system simply oscillates. But the amplitude of this oscillation increases. And at some point, it completely changes behavior. It flips, it flips to the other stationary state. At some point, we go around this stationary state and then the, the system oscillates around that. So very complex behavior. And then you can have parameter spaces for this R where the solutions look completely irregular, not no regular oscillations that can grow or decay, but completely irregular behavior. And then you may go back to, to, to situations where it looks again more regular. So, so 
people have played around with this a lot to study the behavior of these equations, which can be extremely complex. But the, I guess the main point that Lawrence actually wanted to make is that it is possible in such a nonlinear system to have two initial conditions that are very close to each other. And then if the system is nonlinear enough, those solutions may deviate even in a short time strongly. Whereas if you have, a, for example, <laughs> your system is just an exponential decay, then wherever you start, you will decay to, to zero. Of course, we know this. Or oh, well, maybe what Lawrence was expected is that these solutions, they stay close to each other, similar to their initial perturbation, but that didn't happen. And, and, and that is a function of this nonlinear behavior that we have in these equations. So we can expect uh, that two similar initial conditions stay close to each other only for a certain time. And Lawrence estimated that this for the atmosphere, this time scale is about up to 10 days. And then any small deviations, the, the error, the measure in initial difference between two initial states can be as small as, as you can imagine after 10 days, that error will have uh, grown to something that tells us that the, the system is saturated. So the error has already saturated, we become very large. Now that leads us to this idea of kinds of predictability that also Lawrence has invented. So Lawrence has said there are two kinds of predictability. Of predictability. The first kind is the initial condition predictability. So we have, we have a, we measure the state of the atmosphere at time zero, and we make a prediction using our Navier-Stokes equations. What any climate model and any weather forecasting model does. That has a, for the atmosphere at least, from the atmospheric point of view, an inherent predictability limit, which is about 10 to 14 days. After that, we cannot predict the atmosphere anymore precisely. So if we go back to the Lorentz system, um, you know, there, there can be, interestingly, there can be, this is just uh, shown solutions for this, for this Lorentz system in this uh, uh, ZX space again. And there can be, you can be lucky to pick initial conditions where the solutions stay close to each other for a very long time. So the evolution of the system would be along here. And these solutions, you know, even converge. So the, after some time, the, 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 the size of the, of the deviations from, your, from these initial conditions becomes even smaller. So you, you, we, we are really converging. But then there can be other initial conditions. For example, if we go here, then after a few time steps, we cannot predict anymore where we are. And this is a typical behavior. But anyway, um, for the atmosphere, as we say, this is about 10 days to, to uh, two weeks. But, so, and yes, let's have a look at this, what, 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 how this looks like in the atmosphere. So what we are looking at here is the, is the error growth in a seasonal forecasting system in this case, but it could be a weather forecasting model also. So what I've done is I have looked at if the model had initially a very small initial error, so that would be a day zero here. And I compare two realizations, how, how that difference between these two realizations evolves in time. And I do an average over many of, of these small initial errors. Then a typical behavior in the extra tropics, this is a temperature for the two meter temperature variable in the extra tropic would be that, the, that these errors are growing quite slowly. There are some oscillation, but let's say, okay, that this is just noise. But these errors are growing quite 
slowly and then reaching some kind of saturation value. They don't, we don't expect that they grow infinitely because there is some saturation value, some, the climatology of our temperature in Europe at this grid point uh, is, is not that the temperature can go to infinity. There's some typical variation and that is kind of indicated here. So those values are around four to five Celsius or, or Kelvin. Whereas interestingly, in the tropics, if we take a grid point here in Africa, if I take a point in Africa, this initial growth is quite quick within one day. But then this error remains quite limited. So, so much smaller than our, our, our typical error based on two different initial conditions in the extratropics. In the tropics, we can have values that are below one essentially. This is an interesting result for us. So our following, for our now following consideration. Because what does it tell us? Lawrence said there is another kind of predictability, which is called predictability of the second kind that is not any more related to initial condition uh, uncertainty, but to something that may be induced by a change in your boundary conditions. So now I change some, systematically I change some parameter in these Lorentz equations. And the, and, and the question is how now do the solutions react to a change in this parameter? For us, we may think practically on the impact of an El Nino event that, that has on, on the global climate. So imagine there is a persistent El Nino event going on in the tropics. We have seen already that that has teleconnections that will modify the climate in extratropics. But the weather, the daily weather, for example, in Europe or in United States will remain unpredictable. So there will be what we call weather noise. This is very day-to-day -day fluctuations. But there is this perturbation coming from the El Nino phenomenon that may shift our that may shift if we think our stationary points in one or the other direction. Now, as you can already, and, and Lawrence called this, this possible of, uh, possibility of shift of these solutions of this Lawrence attractor, if we shift that enough, then maybe we can distinguish these two, two solutions completely. Or if they just shift a little bit, we may be able to say something at least about the typical behavior of the European or African climate in an El Nino event, but we are still not able to predict, let's say on a seasonal time scale, the particular weather in one grid point. However, this figure here show, shows us that it may be much easier to predict what is happening in a grid point, at least in terms of temperature in Africa compared to Europe. Because if you imagine that a typical El Nino perturbation would be three, three degrees Kelvin in the Pacific, that may have a much stronger impact on this grid point in Africa, not only because El Nino may be closer, but in particular because the typical variation, the, the, the typical error growth in that region is much smaller than in the extra tropics. So in this grid point in Africa, this uncertainty in our model doesn't go much be beyond one Kelvin. So if I have a very strong perturbation of two Kelvin or three Kelvin, that may give us some predictability in this grid point in Africa, whereas in the extra tropics, that may not be enough. So there is this basic difference that is important for to, to kind of consider this predictability of the second kind. Now, predictability of the second kind would be anything that is induced by external parameters or 
um, like this boundary condition El Nino events for the atmosphere. So for example, climate change predictions where we have an increase of the greenhouse gas forcing would be a classical case of predictability of the second kind. We change the CO2 concentration and then the system has to adjust to it. We'll still be chaotic. We'll have this chaotic behavior, but we may push it so much away from its current stationary state that it, it's, it's behaving chaotically in a completely different uh, around a completely different stationary state and that would be analyzed then in these climate change simulations. Now this can be also summarized in this picture a little bit. Now imagine we make now a forecast for Trieste for the next, let's say 10 days, thinking about weather forecast. 10-day weather forecast where we are already at the limit of the predictability. So we have our initial condition uncertainty. Now this initial condition uncertainty comes from the fact that we cannot measure the atmosphere at, in any place exactly. Our measurements have a measurement error always. And our measurements also are not at every place where we need it. Maybe we have, you know, with the satellite, okay, we have a better coverage. But then there are still interpolation techniques to try to, to find the values where you actually need them for your numerical simulation. So that brings us another error. So there are always errors in our initial condition um, prescription. Therefore, what models often do in order to, to find out this uncertainty is they use the ensemble method. They say, okay, I just don't do just one simulation because I know there, there is some typical initial error. So I have to do a hundred simulations just to try to sample the impact of this initial error. I put just some small perturbations that are typical in the, in the order of the initial condition uncertainty, and then I integrate the system. That gives me some idea how well predicted, how well predictable the system is. And then of course, if we compare to the real world, we also have a model uncertainty. So our model itself, apart from the well-known um, pressure gradient forces and so on, Coriolis forces, but then there are the, the frictional effects in the boundary layer that have to be parameterized. There are other um, convective heating and so on may be parameterized. So there are uncertainties in the model themselves. So that also adds if we compare with an observation to uncertainty. But the point is if we make like a 10 day forecast, let's say we do a forecast of today for the 22nd of March. And we look at the climatological uncertainty for that day. So if we look in the last 50 years, we may find on that day, we can have temperatures that range from minus five to plus 20 degrees, looking, just looking at the past. If the model manages to reduce this, even if the model errors are large, but if the model manages, first of all, to remain within this observed range of values, but to reduce that, so the forecast says, oh, I may find values between zero and plus five. Then I have gained something, right? It's not just, a, you know, I have gained some information from my model forecast. Of course, in the worst case scenario, what could happen is your model has a strong bias and drifts away. So your model solution is here, completely outside the observed range. So your model says, the temperature then in 10 days is always between plus 40 and plus 60 degrees. Then of course your model has a problem. You cannot use that model. So you hope that your model is, is kind of, doesn't have strong biases, doesn't have strong drifts and, and reduces this possible um, uncertainty based on climatology uncertainty. Now in the, uh, in the following, we want to just to I want to just to give you some useful numbers that you can use to assess predictability, assuming for the time being that we have a 
a model and we have a we want to compare this model simulation with observations and in particular we don't have a only have a model but we also use this model to create these ensemble situation uh, simulations that are based on small initial perturbations that are in the range of the of the measurement errors and we want to derive here the first criterion that we want to derive is a very important one is the signal to noise ratio that is often used in seasonal in the seasonal prediction context so as an example if we look at the um, prediction that models are doing for the for example for the nino 3.4 index or for the nino 3 index so two sea surface temperature area averages in the pacific in the equatorial pacific um, and then uh, here is the time and here is the anomaly with respect to a long-term climatology. And in that year, we had this El Nino event. So that was the observed. So the black line here is the observed El Nino time series. But then we start our prediction on this day here and uh, that would be February probably. And then what models typically do is as we just said, initially, the, these many simulations may stay close together if we are lucky. But then at some point, they deviate from each other. And even we may not even be sure anymore for summer, for example, for, uh, from the February forecast for the next summer, if, if there is a La Nino or a El Nino. We don't know. We have all the possibilities in this forecast. Now we want to systematically analyze this. So of course, one measure that, that may be useful to do this is what is the spread? What is the spread of this around the ensemble mean? And we have to compare this spread around the ensemble mean with this, with what we can say, what we expect. So here we expect, we can say we expect probably that there will be a warm, still a warm state until April of this of our Pacific. So that, that, that would be called the signal. But this uncertainty, the spread around the ensemble mean would be called noise. So you can immediately intuitively grab that if the noise becomes very large, larger than the signal, which is this deviation of the ensemble mean from the climatological line, then our simulation becomes quite useless because we cannot say anything anymore. So these are the two measures that we want to introduce now here. The first thing we can define, so if we now say that it's, it's X is a model variable at time I, so we discretize in time. And for the ensemble member, we have, let's say, 100 ensemble members, ensemble member J. And then this model variable, that can be, let's say, it's temperature or rainfall, whatever it is. It could be the Nino 3.4 index. But it could also be a, a, a model variable, like temperature or rainfall but it could also valid, be valid for each grid point. So we don't carry here, we don't care about where we are. So we can do this analysis, the following analysis for each grid point of the, of the earth. And we will see this later. We are looking then doing this analysis here for each grid point. So for example, the, the definition of the noise that we have just discussed would be then we can we calculate the ensemble mean, so the mean of all our ensemble members. What is the mean? And the, the noise would be the, the variance of our deviations from this ensemble mean. So just what we have just looked at. Just the variance of these deviations from our ensemble mean. That is the noise. That can be defined as noise. That's this, this value here. And then as it is here, we have summed of over all ensemble members and over the time. So that is just one number 
for our variable x. This is just one number. But imagine you do this for every grid point, then you get a whole field of this. Wherever you measure, or wherever you have a value for precipitation, you can do this for every grid point. And for every grid point, you get a number for the noise and so on. The second number that was interested in was the signal. And the signal would just be the deviation of our ensemble mean from the, from the time mean of the ensemble mean. So in our picture here, since we, that was already set to zero. So we are already looking at anomalies. So we have removed already the mean here. So in this case, the, the signal is just the deviation from the, from the long-term mean because we have, we have removed the mean already before. So in that case, in this case, this, this mean is simply zero. So that is the, another variance quantity. And now, as we said, in order to, uh, to validate if we have a, a strong enough signal, we have to define a measure. The, the measure that is called signal to noise ratio is very useful. So it's just the signal divided by the noise. Now, there can be a problem, of course, or uh, there can be the case when the noise is zero. Now, when the noise is zero, we are extremely lucky. That is a case that will never appear. That means all our simulations show the same result. We can be 100% certain of our forecast. That will never happen in seasonal forecast. But if that happens, then the signal to noise ratio goes to infinity. This may be not such a nice property. So what, what is a good value, a reasonable good value for a signal to noise ratio? It probably depends on a choice, but we could say it's one. Because at least if it's one, the signal is as large as the noise. So we can just say something. We are just on the edge of being able to say something about our prediction. So this value one is probably a reasonable threshold. Then there is a quite useful transformation of this quantity that is called theoretical limit of predictability, which is just a nonlinear transformation. So instead of signal to noise, you say this R limit is square root of signal to noise divided by signal to noise plus one. It turns out this is just like the square root of the signal divided by the total variance, signal plus noise. And the, the advantage of this quantity, which is called our limit often, is that it doesn't vary between zero and infinity, but it varies between zero and one. So if the noise is zero, if all our simulations tell us the same and we can be very confident, then this R limit is one. But if the noise is very large compared to the signal, then this goes to zero and we cannot say anything. So this is often then also interpreted as some kind of correlation skill. This is the expected maximum correlation skill of our ensemble mean. This is the best as a correlation we can expect that our ensemble mean has with observations. And yes, bigger. 81 shows us some examples of this. Oh, this is an example, yeah. This is the first example for signal to noise. This is just from a model, again, from an ensemble model simulations, we need this, and calculate the signal to noise ratio. On top panel here is rainfall. So as you can see, this gives us already some clue. In the tropics, in the Eastern Pacific, we get these values of larger than 20. So that's a large value for signal to noise. We said one is a good value. 20 is a very good value. That is, of course, the region where we have El Nino. So El Nino is very strongly, in the Eastern Pacific, is strongly constraining rainfall. So strongly that there is a lot of predictability of rainfall in the Eastern Pacific. But look, if you go outside that region, it's very difficult to find values that are larger than one. Almost impossible. Almost nothing. 
And the same is true if you look here for the geopotential height at the upper levels. Also, we see this in another projection, we see this high values in the tropics, but then it decays very quickly if we go to the exotropics. And then there are these two nodes that are probably this, the Enzo Taylor connection that gives us an increased predictability, increased signal to noise, but they don't reach one really. And this is an example for this R limit value. This is for a different season, also estimated in this case, focusing on, that was a focus on the East African rainfall. But you can see this, our limit value should vary between zero and one. And we said one is very good. Now we get to something that is 0.7, which would be a signal to noise ratio about one here in the, of course, in this Indonesian region. So, so there we have a strong ENSO impact, we know this. But if we go to Africa, we have to be happy already with, for something that is around 0.4 or something. So the situation is quite complicated. If we look for temperature, this is here uh, our limit value for land surface temperature. We, we kind of see what we have already seen in the last lecture that in the tropics, this limit of predictability is, 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 is much higher. So we have much more predictability. So the values go here very close to one. So we have very good temperature, surface temperature predictability in the tropics because our noise level was so small. Our noise level is so small that, this, that an El Nino phenomenon can kind of give us a lot of predictability. Whereas in the exotropics, that's not the case. So there's another measure that we can use, which is often used, which is called the potential correlation scale. Now this concept derives from the fact that sometimes you want to compare, you have an ensemble simulation, you, you calculate the ensemble mean and want to correlate that in time for a grid point or for let's say for the, take the Nino 3.4 index, you have a observed Nino 3.4 index and you have your model ensemble mean, and they have a correlation. And that is a, that is a number. But it would be interesting to compare that with the, with the number estimated just from the model itself. So what you could do is say, okay, but that should be about the same as if I take one member, if, if, my, if my model simulations are well calibrated, that should be, about the same as if I take out one member of this big ensemble, calculate the, the ensemble mean with all the other members and calculate the correlation between the two. And that gives us, if I have a hundred member ensemble, I can do this a hundred times. So that gives us a, a range of correlation coefficients. So you can then can correlate a hundred times this one simulation that you have taken out with the ensemble mean of all the others that gives us a, a range of correlations. And we can average them, we should average them to get out just one number, which would be this potential correlation skill that then we can compare with the, with the real correlation skill between the model ensemble mean and the observations. If the model is well calibrated, those numbers should be very close to each other. Uh, the problem is you cannot average correlation coefficients. You can do it, but that, that is a biased estimate. If you just average arithmetically the correlation coefficients, you would get an, a biased estimate. So what is suggested is to first do this Fischer-Z transformation of these correlations to, to make them bigger, not ranging just between zero and one because you, it's not good to average them. To, to spread them out, average them, and then do the reverse transformation. That gives a less biased estimate for the average correlation. And you can compare this one, this potential correlation skill, 
with, for example, with the real correlation skill of your model compared to observations. So we have an example here also. Yeah, so this is the, this perfect model correlation skill. Again, highlighting for temperature, for surface temperature, that we get high predictability if I can compare one model simulation with the rest of all the models, gives us a high predictability in tropical regions and less predictability in extratropical regions. So predictability from comparison with observations. Of course, if you, you want to compare clearly your, your model result with observations, so what can we do? The most simple and, and, and first thing that people often do is, is calculate what is called bias. So if you, have an, uh, if you have just one single simulation, you just calculate the difference in time at every grid point, if you want, between your model simulation and an observation. And that is called bias. So if your model is systematically colder than observations, then that bias would be negative. Or if you have an ensemble mean, you have first to calculate the, the mean, the ensemble mean. Now, a little bit more sophisticated measure maybe is what we can call root mean square error, which takes into account deviations and then squares them and then take the square root and so on. So we get an, a measurement of the typical magnitude of variations of deviations because if I cal just calculate the bias, there could be huge errors that oscillate and then they average out to something that is almost zero. But your root mean square error would measure all these large deviations and say, oh, wow, well, but, the, but there, there's a large root mean square error, even though the mean bias may be small. The problem with the root mean square error is that it may be difficult for you to identify what is a good value. So if you have a root mean square error of surface temperature of one Kelvin, is your model performing well or not well? How can you judge this? Another measure that is easier to judge in this respect is just the correlation skill. So you are, you're, you're, you're analyzing how well is your model reproducing in time for any variable, the time evolution at each grid point. That gives us a correlation that we can calculate for each grid point if we want to. That gives us some kind of this correlation skill. The, the advantage of this correlation skill is that it varies between zero, no, varies between minus one and one. And so negative values, of course, mean that it's, it's not very reasonable. Your, your model didn't reproduce very well the observations. Here we may be able to pick that's independent of the magnitude of our, of our, even of the dimension of our field has no dimension. So we may pick just a threshold of 0 0.5 or 0 0.7 as a, what is a good value here that is independent of the variable. So it's a little bit easier, but we can also use some kind of transformed root mean square error, which is called in this case, Briar skill score to make use of the root mean square error. But in order to make use of a Rigman square error, it's, it's good to have a baseline forecast. So we have to compare our, our model forecast with the trivial forecast in order to make a statement. Are we better than this trivial forecast or are we worse than this trivial forecast? This trivial forecast can be different things. For climate forecast, you would often pick climatology we have to beat climatology. We have to be able better to say than oh, the average temperature we expect for Trieste in December is, let's say, five degrees. Uh, and, the, uh, and the root mean square error of the climatological forecast, of course, we can guess from observations what that is. That is the typical variation then for every that is the, 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 the variance in this case around this, um, this mean value. 
And we can compare this with the variance in our, uh, the deviations of our model from the observations. And only if our model is performing better than this trivial forecast, that means if, if this Breyer skill score in this case is larger than one, then we have a useful forecast. Because if our, if our root mean square error is larger than the climatological one, then we get a negative skill score and that is not useful anymore. So we may be able to use this. There's one more technique before we completely wrap up this course. There's one more technique that I want to introduce that is very useful, that I'm using very frequently, and I think is, is very useful for investigating links between El Nino, for example, and rainfall in any place of the world. So in this, this technique is called a linear regression. So imagine you have an index that measures the ENSO, that could be the Nino 3.4 index, I in this case. And you want to know how this is related to rainfall at any grid point. So R is here for rainfall at any grid point that is related to the Nino 3.4 index. Then you can write this a linear relationship in the easiest case. And then you have a, then you have an observation of that rainfall. And of course you, you, you can investigate the linear relationship by minimizing the, the deviation between the observed rainfall and this model rainfall by this simple linear relationship. That's the definition of linear regression coefficients. So for this B coefficient, which is the most important one here, which gives us for how much variation of this Nino 3.4 index, I get how much change in rainfall you can easily, that's an easy exercise to minimize this and to, res to solve this for A and B. Of course, you find this in any textbook. And for, for this coefficient B, we get that this is just determined by the covariance between the rainfall and the index divided by the square of the standard deviations of the variance of this index. That gives us how sensitive is rainfall over India, for example, or over Africa to the variation in the, of the temperature in the Nino 3.4 region. Um, now there can be, if you normalize this index before, sometimes people normalize this index, then there, there can be slightly different formulations of this regression coefficient. And this is, this B star is the one that is typically used. So, for example, some of the maps that we have looked already, this composite, ENSO composite for rainfall and for winds have been calculated exactly in this manner. So we take the Nino 3.4 index, we calculate the covariance globally with the, with the rainfall, and, and, and do the proper normalization and we get this composite map, a very robust composite map. And you can compare this if you have a model simulation and if you, if you want to understand why your model is performing not well, you may be also doing this with your model and compare these two maps and say, oh, I get a negative correlation actually in some region because the ENSO teleconnection is completely wrong in the model. And then you may, you may be able to explain why your model has biases in these teleconnections. Okay, so with this, um, this course is finished. At some point we will have to have an exam. As it looks now, this exam will be online, but I don't know. Uh, if the situation changes, then we can have it in person, which would be better. Before the exam, I think as soon as possible, probably, I will send you the exam from last year. So you can practice and get some idea what would be typical questions that are asked. Okay, so that, that should give us a good idea of what is the type of question and 
you can study that then for the exam. Okay, hope to see you sometime in person, but uh, that may take some time. Until then, uh, have a good exam this afternoon and see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.